You may be asking yourself, in today's age, where we've got faster computers and better simulation software, why do we need to do a hand calculation when I can just do a detailed FEA model that gets us to the result faster? And surely it's more accurate. But this is where you're fundamentally misunderstanding what the benefits of hand calculations are. So let's break down the benefits and impact that hand calculations can have. Hand calculations are more than just putting a number down on a piece of paper. They're about evaluating your engineering intuition and your knowledge about how buildings actually behave. They're really great for validating that FEA software, as you can put a lot of results in, making a really complex model. But how do you know if it's correct? If you throw garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. And if you have no way of validating the results, how do you know what you put in there is either garbage or gold? Yes, the hand calculation will typically be a little bit less sensitive and may not be as accurate, but provided that you're within ballpark or the right magnitude, you know that the FEA results are about correct of what you're expecting. And if you do see a difference between your FEA and hand calculation model, it's not about trusting the FEA or the hand calculation. You have to go back to both of them to see what assumptions you made in the hand calculation, or what assumptions you made in the model, and did you actually apply the forces correctly? So it's a good way to make both your intuition of your hand calculation and your modeling correct to validate the results are good. As I was saying, that hand calculation also helps you build your intuition about how buildings actually behave as you're trying to simplify and simulate the results from a more complex system. You're training your engineering judgment and intuition about how a building actually behaves. So can it actually pass the sniff test? Can you look at it and say that result is about correct? Wait a minute, I'm missing something. And that hand calculation helps you fine tune that intuition that you need to build up over time. It also helps you break down your problem solving skills. You see that the fact that you need to look at a complex system and break it down into more simpler subsets of problems means that you need to look at a problem and break it down into those simple aspects that truly understand how the structure is actually behaving. And if you can't do that, you shouldn't be throwing it back into that FEA as you don't truly really know, you're just throwing it in and hoping for the best. Despite their importance, they're often something that's often overlooked bypassed, especially in today's age, where we need to get things faster and faster and faster and faster and faster to get to a result. To do a good set of calculations, it's really time consuming to make them look pretty and neat, especially if you have to redo them over and over and over again. And if you're writing down the results by hand, plugging into a calculator and getting a result out, it can be error prone, not necessarily because the calculator is incorrect, but maybe you wrote down the wrong answer. And if you are doing it on a pen and paper, like I suggest a lot of people to do because it increases your intuition and makes it even harder to share as you'll need to scan it in and send it off to someone that will then have to mark it up and put it down on a piece of paper too. And it's also hard unless you're really organized to keep them in a logical place, keep them named correctly so that you can find them again later when you need them. Now I hear everyone shouting from the rafters, how about Excel? Excel has its place and it's typically in the bulk translation of a lot of data, not these individual can calculations to validate your results. As you can make a dynamic spreadsheet, you can make it look a little bit pretty, but you have no way of validating the results that are put into it. And this is something that I've helped co-found is that math jot that allows you to calculate your results but it's also reusable, so it saves you time on developing your inputs. So you can spend a lot of time on the back end validating the results of a hand calculation to fine tune it to make sure it's correct, make it look nice, but also something that is dynamic that you can reuse over time. And as it is digital, you can save those templates to reuse over time, meaning that it saves you time and money while still having that same explainer value. And the benefit of having it in this type of format, you can see how the numbers flow through, how things are calculated, and how it's actually assessed, boosting your intuition in structural engineering. And with a little click of the button, you can hit share and share it with all your colleagues that can come back, either reuse it, make comments, or adjust it. And as it is dynamic, you stop all those human-induced errors of people packing numbers in, getting results out, and spitting it out to the next answer and it's take it with you anywhere. It's not just on your software, you can have it on your iPad and use it in many different places. So in the middle of a meeting, you can pull out your iPad, throw some numbers in and get you to a result where you can actually have true conversations with the architect and play in real time. So you're on your table, sketching up stuff, assigning where the columns need to go, what the thickness of the slabs need to be and the size of those columns as you're working on the table with the architect instead of having to slow it down, go back to the office and do that calculation. So let's just solve one of those classic problems and we'll jump into MathJot quickly 
and go through the results. So we'll just plug in the problem here quickly. We'll just go L, we'll go underscore one. So that means we can get the subscript of one into the answers equals six. We use the meters after it to get to that meter result as there is actually units inside MathJot. Let's use a UDL of five kilonewtons per meter. And then with a simple formula, we can say MX, again, using the subscript as we do have different ways we can use those formulas is equal to five. No, we won't actually put the number in. We'll put the dynamic number above, which was W times the beam length. So we're going times, but what was the variable that I used? If we look back, we can see it was L1. We just hit tab across and go down into the box and insert that L1. Now don't forget the squared divided by eight. And you can see, you get to the answer quickly. But if we do need to change the results for that UDL, let's change it to 10. We can see here it dynamically updates that result. Now, if you don't have any of the right units, the little tips and tricks here is we can change the units that we need to get something from. So if we wanna have it in Newton millimeters instead of kilonewton meters, we can just go down to the results that we had before. So the WAL squared on eight, space in, so IN, space, little k, capital N, little m. So the designation for moment, kilonewton meters. And you can see here, the results are now changed. If you did enjoy this video, you'll obviously like this video here about the one thing about structural engineers need to know that make your designs easier and simpler. And if you're interested in supporting the channel, there are two ways that you can do this. You can either become a YouTube and Patreon member. Without the support of my YouTube and Patreon members, this type of content would not be possible. I hope to see you next time and keep learning.